got something prepared for you that's greater than the eye. God has prepared something great for us. And uh, this morning's word is a word that was birthed in my spirit the last few days. And I'm going to get this, through this pretty quickly because I, I really think it's going to release something pretty phenomenal in revelation to our hearts this morning. The Lord is bringing us to the place that he's literally opened the door. And I had a vision Friday night during worship that there was a door that was opening. I saw a big lock and a big door. And at the time, I didn't understand it other than it's a door opening <laughs> and there's glory on the other side of the door. And, you know, that's not a big revelation because that's pretty much something that's pretty simple to see. But I began to ask, like, Lord, let me see things that you're about to do. And so that came to me Friday night. And But the explanation of that or the what that meant really began to be revealed to me actually this morning. The Lord said, I'm going to show them the way to the holy place. I'm going to show you how to live in the holy place. I wrote a book a number of years ago called Show Me Your Glory, and it's really something that you should go back and revisit because the, re the revelation that's in that book is phenomenal. Um, and it wasn't really setting down to write something. It was a series of messages that I preached, and we transcribed them and just basically put them in a book. But it was going through that process of entering into a higher realm of his presence. And that's the goal of the church, is to come deeper into the glory of the presence of the Lord. How many believe that's a good thing? And the book of Hebrews, we're going to kind of skip around tonight, this morning. I said tonight. We've been up a long time, right? We're going to skip around a little bit because there, there's a principle here found in Hebrews chapter 8, chapter 9, and chapter 10. So I'm not going to read a lot of scripture, but I want to read a few. Uh, it, it talks about in chapter 9 about this verse. It says the, even the covenant, verse 1, the covenant had ordinances of divine service in the earthly sanctuary. For a tabernacle was prepared, the first part in which was the lampstand, the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And behind the second veil, the part of the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all which had the golden altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid on all sides with gold, in which were the golden pot that had the manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tablets of the covenant. Now, I, I'm going to stop there because I talk to you just a little bit about that because we know that, that the Lord is showing us in Hebrews 8, 9, and 10 uh, and showing us about the, the old covenant and the the way the tabernacle looked and the way that God revealed that tabernacle to us, but he translates that all into a newer covenant, a better covenant that's where Jesus Christ himself becomes the access into the father's heart. Whereas in the old covenant, there was three courts. There was an outer court, there was a holy place, and then there was a place called the Holy of Holies. And we know that the Holy of Holies was the the place that only the high priest would go once a year. And he would make sacrifice for all the sins of the people. Well, the interesting thing about the high priest, a little known thing that's found in the book of Leviticus, is that when he would go into this holy place, he had to go in absolutely clean. There could be no defilement in him whatsoever. Because if there was anything that was unclean about him, he would die in the presence of the Lord. So apparently this happened a few times, and so they started tying a cord on the man's ankle with bells. And as long as he, they could hear the bells jingling, they knew he was okay, but the bells quit jingling for a while. They knew that another one done bit the dust. So they would pull him out of the Holy of Holies because he had perished because there was something of uncleanness in him. And... Um, how many have ever felt like <laughs> your bells have quit tingling? 
There's been a few times in the presence of the Lord that uh, I've been like a dead man. That uh, a lot of people get excited about the presence of God. And we, well, we should. But oftentimes, my encounter with God has been less than exciting. It's been devastating. Uh, and if you don't, can't relate to what I'm talking about, maybe you need to have one of those encounters. Because there's something about his presence that does not allow that which we want to be exist any longer. The presence is like a purifying fire that purifies our hearts and gets us ready for what God wants us to be. And so in this covenant, in this, in this um, holy place, you found, you found three things. You found, the, you found the manna that was in a pot. Now, that's interesting because guess what? Manna doesn't exist past one day in other parts of the Scripture. Because after a day, it starts stinking, and it has worms in it. But here we have a pot of manna that's in the, in the holy place that's still fresh. So it, it means that when you're in his presence, there will be a sustaining life that's giving to you. How many understand that? How many love the, the sustaining life and the strength that the Lord brings to us? For in his presence, there's life. his presence, there's joy forevermore. In the presence of the Lord, there's joy. Everybody say, there's joy in the presence. And so this golden pot of manna is still there, remaining fresh. Just like in our relationship to God, every time we encounter the Lord, there's a spirit of freshness that God gives us. How many sense that? Just like this morning, I sense a spirit of freshing. And this book of Acts says that, that when you repent or when you come back to God, when you return to him, he will send to you a spirit of refreshing that will come from heaven. The church needs to walk in the spirit of refreshing that comes from heaven. Free from the, the burden and the bondage and the destruction of the human nature. Free from the passing scene around us that's causing us to be uh, discouraged or to demand what's happening on the passing scene. And I, I've already predetermined how I'm going to respond Wednesday morning after the election. Because even if the person I'm believing for is not elected, I'm not going to let that affect how I feel. Amen? Because I... As great as the election may be and as more as important as it may seem, and to some it may even seem as a life life changing event. But let me tell you this I only have my source in him. It's in him I live and breathe and have my me, m being. Everything that I am is a part of what because of what I am in him. Not what the world says to me how I'm supposed to act, how I'm supposed to react, how I'm supposed to respond. I'm responding to my life that I found inside the holy place. Hallelujah. Because that's my manna. That's that which sustains me every day. Lord, give me this day my daily bread. Let me know today who I am in you. Hallelujah. Not only was there a, a pot of manna inside there, there was the the Ark of the Covenant, right? And there was a, there was a uh, Aaron's rod. Now, this was the rod of Aaron the priest. You remember the story that when the, the number of candidates came and they all threw down their rods, it was only Aaron's rod that budded. Not only did it bud, it blossomed and blossomed into fruit. And so here's Aaron's rod inside, inside the... Uh, holy place, and it, it tells to us that God wants to be a miracle to us every day. He wants something to happen in our life that the anointing of the Lord that can produce a continual revelation of his presence and his miracle provision through us. That no matter what's happening around us, there's always a bloom, there's always a blossom there's always a fruit that's being produced in our life. How many want to walk that way? Amen? Wow. Free from everything outside. When we're inside with him, 
we have the abundance of the Lord. I love this stuff, don't you? And, it, and really, we haven't got to the word. It's going to get good. But I can take what we got already and stop there, right? Okay, bye. We'll see you tomorrow. Okay. Now, when we get back to this whole principle of the Lord in this, he became the high priest for us. And it goes on to explain in Hebrews chapter 9 that we don't need to do this any longer. We don't have to come to God through an old covenant relationship because now Jesus Christ has come to be the perpetuation of our sin. He's become the one that it took all of our sin. In fact, it goes on to say that he even removes for us the consciousness of what sin is all about. There's such a thorough cleansing that God performs upon his people that turn to him that he literally transforms them into a new creature. Everything that they were in the old is passed away, and behold, everything has become new to them. And where are you, Josh? Josh back here, come Friday night. We baptized him last su Sunday, and he came in with his eyes were glistening, and he said, man, I've had a great week. And uh, that's a good news. I'd like for some more of you to testify you've had a great week. He said, I've had a great week. Everything is different. And, you know, he was baptized last Sunday, and it's no surprise everything's different because the old man was buried. Now the new man has come alive. Amen? And so we begin to see and begin to hear, begin to, begin to perceive everything about us is different and new. That's what I felt this morning. I felt this morning what it says in Revelation is a return to your first love. Because when I focus back upon this priest that gave everything for me, that made a sacrifice, where now I just of holy think about him. And the love that he had for me to make that sacrifice, my heart is renewed. Hallelujah. My voice begins to the Lord. Amen. Everybody say, I'm a worshiper. What's the primary goal of the church, number one? All your mind, all your it's not is that you do, that you go out and do this and do that. You heal the sick, raise the dead, witness to people, uh, be a testimony, do all those things. Those are all important. But the primary goal of the Christian is to become a worshiper and a lover of who he is. When I was caught up to the Lord in 1989, I was caught up to the throne room. It was a two-hour experience, and uh, I was caught up to meet with Jesus, but I was also caught up to the throne room of God. And the thing that was so overpowering was the worship. And it was exciting because there was people from every tribe and every nation and every tongue and from every universe that was there. Wow, there's some freaky looking people out there but they all had one thing in common they were there because they were lovers of who he was and the worship the worship of the kingdom in in the throne room of god is so incredible have you ever heard have you ever seen have you ever experienced a touch from god where you heard that worship that's there in the highest place there's nothing like it Yet there will be that like it upon the earth once again. I believe that God's people are going to become so in oneness with who he is and their worship and their expression of love and gratitude towards the Lord that the sound that's been heard there will also be heard upon the earth. If you're, if you're stuck in a pattern of worship or a form of worship that seems to be pleasing, get ready, there's more coming. Because when God's people begin to respond with an intensity of 100% out of their hearts, the purity of their own hearts reaching to God, it'll create a sound like it's never been heard upon the earth before. Then all of a sudden the earth will say, heaven has come to the earth. Wow. Mm. My, my, my. 
Hebrews 4 says, verse 14, seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed. Seeing that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. <laughs> Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace in our time of need. Hallelujah. Are you ready for that? And, and so in this principle, it's so phenomenal how God opened this door for us to bring us in to this place called the kingdom of God. To bring us into this full expression of his nature upon the earth. See, the Lord took you beyond the veil with him. And, and he shows this in Hebrews 8, 9, and 10. He shows us that I, as the son of God, I've entered into this place beyond the veil. Now, I'm going to bring all of you with me. I'm going to bring all of you. And it's, it, it likens to what it says in Romans, that the Lord brings us to this place where all of a sudden now we can say, there's the Father. Abba. Father. The, the one thing that I want to be envious of that I read in the Word of God is this great relationship that Jesus had with the Father. Because there was nothing greater than this relationship. He said, Lord, the glory that we share together, this glory that you've given me, this inside track that I have into your heart, this knowledge, this wisdom that comes from your spirit as your son, I want to give this to them. Lord, I want the same spirit that quickened my body and raised me from the dead also to quicken them, raise them up, that they may know you, that they may experience this wonderment of the knowledge of God into their lives. That was the whole purpose of Jesus. And the, the whole purpose peripheral things come with it of course but we get so caught up in trying to do the things of God we forget that really it's not doing the things of God it's knowing the Lord and then out of that all the doing happens right how many want to do the do well you got to know the who <laughs> say it with me do to do know the who there you go. You got it now. Now you can turn to someone and say, you now you're a biblical scholar. <laughs> See, the greatest expression of the church is coming to the place that it can minister from the other side of the veil. We don't want to minister in the sanctuary. We don't want to minister even in the holy place. We want to minister from the holiest of holy places. Mm. And in the midst of the holiest of holy places, guess what happens there? Transfiguration. Because to be in that environment of the presence of God and that presence and power means that you're transfigured, transformed into another image. That's why it says in the book of Romans that all the creation is waiting for this, the revealing or the manifestation of the sons of God. They're waiting for people that have come into a holy place experience where the, the nature of the Father has become their nature. The heart of the Father has become their heart. The motivation of the Father is their motivation. The will of the Father is their will. Doesn't that make everything else in life seem a little petty when you get into that kind of relationship? Does it make you worry about your utility bills? Worrying about what Sister Sally said to you? Worrying about the Democrats or the Republicans? Worrying about this and worrying about that? Doesn't it make it all a little insignificant when all of a sudden you've been transformed into the mind of God? 
You know what God did to, that, to Jesus? He said, now he's lifted it up and he's seated with him in heavenly places. He brought Christ all the way from a grave, through a cross to a grave, out of the grave into the heavens to a heavenly place, and he seated him at his own right hand. And the Bible says in the book of Ephesians that God now has seated you. You. Turn to somebody and say, it's you. You're seated in a heavenly place with him. Far above all principalities and powers. Far above every conflict of the earth. You are seated with Christ. In absolute, 100% total victory. Don't you ever view yourself as the beggarly element of the world again. Begin to you view yourself as the absolute completion of who God has declared you to be. You can be nothing less than that when you're in him. As hard as you may try, as hard as you may resist, God's path for you is to the highest place. Oh, but wait a minute, there's a caveat. There's always a caveat. You have a responsibility to get there. God has chosen you. He's predestined you. He's intended for you to be there with him. But he gave you the choice. He gave you the key to unlock the door. Behold, I've set before you a door that no man can shut. Book of Revelations. No man can stop you. Only you can stop yourself. Mm. Lord, don't let me have anything to do with it. <laughs> Sorry, God don't work that way. He doesn't make you do anything. Someone said, well, how's this election going to turn out? They asked Bobby Connor. He, they said, they want the prophet to tell them. That's easy, isn't it? The prophets tell us what's going to happen. No, Bobby said, whoever you choose. <laughs> we choose. Well, don't you think it's the will of God that so-and-so win or this one win? No, you choose who wins. Is it the will of God that you prosper and be in health? Is it the will of God that you be exalted and be strengthened? Is it the will of God that you be free and that you be powerful, that you be anointed? Is it the will of God for all of those things for you? Is it the will of God that you be seated with him in the heavenly places? But you choose. Do you want that? What do you choose? Jesus chose. Wait a minute. Jesus didn't make a choice. We know that Jesus' path was plain from the day one. The day he was born of the Virgin Mary, we knew what was going to happen. No, we didn't. The Bible wasn't written yet. Jesus made a choice of what would happen. Because God had to work it that way. He had to find one man that would choose something different than what Adam chose. Adam chose his own way. Adam made his own decisions. So he sent a man that says, okay, this man, I'm praying. I can see Father, Father saying, I'm praying, cross my heart, hope to die, <laughs> that my son will make the right choice. Because everything in the world, in the universe, and all that God intended for man to be depended upon this one man making the right choice. Well, he had to make the right choice. No, he didn't. He didn't have to. Why do you think the devil tempted him in the wilderness? The devil tempted him to make another choice. But God said, I'm going to make the choice. Jesus said, I'm going to make the choice. Because you've got to understand, even though Jesus was 100% God, he was also 100% man. He was like you in all things was tempted. He, the same weaknesses that you carry. In fact, it says in Hebrews, he was like a high priest that sympathizes with your weaknesses because he himself was weak. He 
He himself was weak. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Yet, he resisted. When sin was presented to him, just like it's presented to you, it said he resisted. He says, now have you yet resisted to the shedding of blood? He resisted to the shedding of blood. So I just can't help myself. I just, sin is just overwhelming me. Sin, sin is just consuming me. Have you tried resisting it yet? I can't help myself. I'm such a sinner. Yes, you can help yourself. Jesus made a way for you to escape. But I failed. That's okay. He'll still forgive you. If any man fails, let him ask of the Lord. He'll forgive him and cleanse him of all unrighteousness. I can't tell you how many times. I feel like I've worn out ten repenting things in my lifetime. Do you ever have to repent? Of course. Sometimes I have to repent just for getting up in the morning. <laughs> but I keep turning back to the one. I keep turning back. I don't care how weak I've been or even how weak I might be tomorrow. I'm still looking to my strength that cometh from him. Well, I failed, so I might as well give up. Be a loser. It's not failing that's, that's the test of your life. It's how you deal with it. I got to get to the good point now. Mm. Oh, my goodness. Look at this. This blows my mind. Mm. Oh, wow. Hebrews chapter 10. Therefore, verse 5, when he came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offerings you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. And burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you had no pleasure. Then I said, this is Jesus. Then I said, who's he saying it to? Father, behold, I've come. In the volume of the book, it's been written of me. The whole book is written to tell you this statement right here. I have come to do your will. Previously saying sacrifice and offering, burnt offerings and offerings for sin, you did not desire nor had pleasure in them which are offered according to the law. Then he said, behold, I've come to do your will, O God, in order for you to take away the first, so you can establish the second. Wow. As Christ came to the earth, he only became what he was because he was willing to do the will of the one who sent him. He had to be, he had to be absolutely free from any desire in his own heart to choose any other direction. See, as long as you reserve the right to choose your direction, your direction will always separate you from the Father. It's only in your absolute submission and abandonment to live your life yielded to his will that you begin to reveal who he is through you. The world is not looking to see a refined, refurbished, remodeled Christian. They're looking to see him upon the earth. They don't want a Christian that have refined their service to where they appear to be righteous 
in their model of following a religion that have put on a spirit of holiness on their outside, but inside they're corrupt. But he wants a people that have the purity of motivation that Christ had in his relationship to the Father, that in his will, he said, my will is sure your will. I have no secondary agenda beyond that, but one will only is to do his will. And when the church of the Lord Jesus Christ begins to have that attitude, it's when we become the temple of the Holy Spirit that God dwells upon the earth. When we become the manifestation of his presence and the holy of holies is revealed to all the world to see is when it comes out of the purity of your heart. And as Christ offered himself, we also become an offering. As Paul even said, I am an offering poured out for you. Say, so wait a minute. Wait a minute. Aren't we all perfect in Christ Jesus? Yes. Thank God. Does that, isn't that enough? Isn't it enough that he did all this for me? Yes. But it's not enough for you. Until you. Follow what it says in 2 Corinthians 7, 1. Therefore having these promises beloved let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit and let us perfect holiness in the fear of God it says in another scripture without holiness no man shall see the Lord and we can misinterpret that very easily we say well okay let's get ourselves holy no, you can't get yourselves holy. <laughs> if you try to get yourself holy, you'll really be holy. You'll be leaking all over. It's not a matter of you coming and say, well, I've got to straighten my life out now so I can get right with God. No, you don't straighten your life out. God has already made a straight way for you. But you simply come as a vessel that yields itself. Like... David even cried out, Lord, create in me a clean heart. David prayed another prayer, Lord, take the hyssop. And hyssop is a, I used to drink hyssop. I don't know, is it an herb? Because it's supposed to cleanse your blood. It's a cleansing agent. But the hyssop, he said, wash me with hyssop. Scrub me. Wash something out of me that creates something new in me. The Lord takes away the first in order to bring forth the second. He takes away the old man in order to reveal the new man. We, the church, don't religiously approach God and say, okay, God, we, now we've got to get our act together. No, we just simply come as worshipers. Behold, I've come to do your will. Wow. It's amazing what God can do with a yielded vessel. I was privileged back in the early 70s to be involved in four of the Catherine Coleman's meetings. <laughs> I've never seen anything like it since. Freaky, freaky, freaky. Power of God. My Lord. Whew. Man. I mean, beyond what you can even imagine. But this is a woman that was so weird. And oftentimes, God's people are a little weird. Paul said, I've become a fool for Christ. I mean, look at George and Banoff. He's weird. Weird people. And there's others I could tell. You all know George. God uses weird people. Sometimes weirdest people you can imagine. The least likely that you could choose, if you were to choose the most likely. They'd be the least likely. God uses weird people. God used Catherine Coleman. And I was standing on, I was in a platform with her in Lubbock, Texas, and I was on the third row back with my associate pastor. 
And she was up there maybe 20 feet from us, and she was flowing in the Spirit. The place was packed out with thousands of people, thousands of people outside. The glory of God, you could just feel it. I mean, I like it when the glory does that, right? <laughs> just pulsating. And my associate guy, he was, he was critical, and he was saying, he was whispering to me, that woman looks like a fake. Look at her in her long dress and her bony pointed fingers. And this is all hype and hysteria. And he's whispering this stuff to me. And this is, I mean, the place is loud. I mean, the Dino's playing the piano and they're singing. And, and she whirls around with this long bony finger. Pow, like a guided missile system. She points at this man named Alan. We're standing there. She points at him, 20 feet away, two rows separating us from her. He flies, he, he was picked up in the air, off the ground, and flew, and knocked over three or four rows behind him. Laying on the ground back there, I thought he's dead. I went back there to bend over to minister the last rites. <laughs> he's going, shikalala boko sonda la la I mean, the guy was just getting glory on him. He wasn't even speaking in tongues before that finger pointed at him. That was the glory. This woman came out of the holy of holy places and put her finger on that man's heart. When I looked in her eyes, I freaked out because I couldn't see Catherine Kuhlman. All I saw was Jesus. Whew. Wow. That's all was there. And this was a woman fraught with fraught with problems. She had had relationship problems. She had had all kinds of problems. And the press was make sure you knew about it. But yet she kept saying, all I care to yield my life to him. It reminded me of someone I read about named Jesus. <laughs> All I care about, Lord, is to do your will. And they looked at Jesus. Oh, a man he eats with sinners. Disqualify him. They looked at Jesus and they said, a man that doesn't keep the Sabbath, disqualified they looked at Jesus, a man that turned over the money changers in the temple and called the Pharisees whitewashed walls and broods of vipers, disqualified. Yet with the one that counted the most, he was the most qualified. He pleased the one that had sent him. They looked at David and they said, oh, a man that committed adultery, disqualified. A man that plotted to murder, his adulterous relationships, husband, disqualified. But God said, there's a man after my own heart. Because this man says, Lord, I've come to do your will. I imagine that if we sent the National Enquirer after any of you, you'd all be disqualified. Because they, they would either... They would either prove something or make something up. But nevertheless, once we read it, you'd be disqualified, right? We're all disqualified. There's none righteous. No, not one of us. No, not one of us could qualify. But, but through him, we become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Through that one who perfected once and for all that sacrifice and gave his life for us. Now we too can come qualified, qualified, qualified to be found in him, not having our own righteousness, no excuse for our sin, no excuse for our failure, and we never make an excuse. We simply keep coming back and presenting ourselves. We keep doing what it says about, we keep returning to the Lord time and time again knowing the frailty of our human nature and the subjection that it is subjected sometimes to the futility of the world, but yet we keep coming back 
to the king of glory. Great and mighty and strong is he. We keep coming back to that one who gives us everything. My, my, my. Sanctified. Jesus said, I'm, you are sanctified. I like that sanctification word, don't you? We could preach that, couldn't we? Everybody say, sanctified. 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 Consecrated. What was Jesus to the Father? He sanctified himself. He consecrated, which are synonymous one with another, but it means to set yourself apart. To identify yourself apart. To present yourselves, it says in Romans, as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. That's what becomes and what, what defines a son. You become a son and you're defined as a son by your willingness to set yourself apart to the Father. See, when you abandon yourself to this, when you're willing to give yourself to this, in spite of maybe your, even your lack of revelation of this, the moment you give yourself to it is the moment you become it. The moment you begin to express it. The moment that everything that's been wrong begins to be covered by the blood of Jesus. God will cover you well. He really will. He will cover you well. Covered by the blood. Washed by the blood. The worshipers that wash themselves to prepare themselves to be in that presence of their Father. We're washed, cleansed to be presented to him as the true worshipers of him, the true worshipers of the Father. Wow. He says, he goes on to say in 2 Corinthians, in what agreement, chapter 6, verse 16, what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. And God has said, listen to this, I will dwell in them and I will walk among them. I will be their God and they will be my people. Wow. Therefore, come out from among them. Be separate, saith the Lord, and don't touch the unclean things. And I will receive you. I will be a father to you. And you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Whew. Lord. 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 <laughs> the glory. Okay. Today's the day to consecrate, not to condemn. Don't take this message in any part say, well, I missed it. I'm bad. No, God's not telling you that. He's just saying, okay, just turn to me. That's all you got to do. Just turn. Here I am. Here I am. I'm waiting for you just to say, here I am. Here I am. Here I am. Lord, here I am. <laughs> no consciousness of my sin. No thought of my failure. There have been many of them, but Lord, here I am today. I'm free from that. I'm with you. Whew. Let us now press in to the Lord. Let us be encouraged in this hour. And I'll close with this. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and every sin which easily ensnares us. And now let us run the race that's set before us with endurance, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy 
set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and now has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For considering him who has endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. Wow. Lord, I'm not discouraged this morning. I'm encouraged. I'm encouraged that the door that's before me that once seemed locked, you've now given me a key. And I can unlock it anytime I choose. All I've got to be willing to say is that, well, Lord, when I walk through this door, it's to walk with you, to be with you, to be in your presence. Everybody take your key out this morning. Hold your right key in your right hand. <laughs> Lord said, so I've given you the keys. I've given you the keys of David. I've given you the key to my kingdom. I give you the key to my sons, to becoming sons and daughters of my kingdom. I've given you the key. I've given you access. I've let I've entered in now. I'm letting you enter into the same place that I had with the Father. Everybody say, I'm turning my key. I'm unlocking the door. And say this with me. Behold, Lord, I've come to do your will as it's written in the volume of the book. Amen.